Welcome to the section on the superficial back line. So let's begin by looking at some of the basic anatomy of it. So the superficial back line includes the cranial fascia across the top of the head, as well as the occipit and the small suboccipital muscles that are close to the spine, uh, rectus spinae, uh, the paraspinals and the sacral lumbar fascia are all part of this back line channel, as well as the hamstrings, the gastrocnemius, and the Achilles tendon. Now, at the bottom of the Achilles tendon, it spreads over the heel and becomes the plantar fascia, and uh, the toe extensors are also a part of this. So let's try a little exercise here so that you can feel this fascial plane. And what I want you to do is extend one of your legs, or both of them, one is fine, and we're going to begin by just pushing through the heel and filling the stretch on the Achilles tendon. And just take notice to see how far that goes. Like, do you feel that up into the calf? How far do you feel that stretch from the Achilles tendon up through the calf muscles? And now we want to extend the toes out, so point them away from you. Notice how that changes. And now push the heels back out. And this time, continue to push it, and push it really hard, so you're strongly exerting pushing force of the heels away from you, and do so until it starts to lock the knee. And when you lock your knee out while doing this, you'll notice that you can feel more of the stretch into the hamstring, hold that, push harder through the heel, and you'll probably start to feel that tug in your lower back too, or in the sacral area. So this is that fascial plane. When we're pushing through the heel and extending it out in a way, locking the knee, it'll stretch that whole fascial area from the Achilles tendon up the leg, the thigh, and into the sacral area. And I can fill it up into my low back even. So a little exercise there. And I use that with my clients too when I'm treating back pain or sacral area pain or these sorts of superficial backline conditions. It's a nice way to get them stretching and moving. And I may just have a few needles in the hand and have them do that. And then that can um, just add to the results of the treatment. And it makes a nice little takeaway exercise for them to do as well on their own so that they can uh, do some gentle stretching at home to uh, start to make some improvement as well. Now here on the right side, you'll see the urinary bladder meridian. And we know that it begins in the inner eye and it goes over top of the head, includes the occiput and the neck and the erector spinae muscles. It also includes the sacral lumbar fascia and the low back, and then it passes through uh, the gluteus maximus area and down through the hamstrings and the gastrocnemius and into the Achilles tendon. Now, we see a bit of a divergence here, though we don't typically think of the Achilles tendon as being on the bladder meridian, but it so the meridian extends to the outer ankle and little toe. Now this is different than what we think about in the fascial planes, um, but I encourage you to explore these differences between the two of them because there's actually some insights that can be gained when you explore the similarities as well as the differences between these things. And a lot of times these differences have to do with meeting points and wall connecting points and these types of things. So that's uh, something to explore a little bit as well. Okay, let's take a look at the next page that reads points and bands on the superficial back line. So as we speak about this back line, there's two major point groups or regions or bands that we want to discuss. And the first one is what I'm going to refer to as the gastrocnemius band. And that includes the area from UB40 down to UB57. Uh, you can see in the image on the left that blue region is indicating this area, and then the image on the right shows the gastrocnemius muscle. Now, UB40 is quite well known in TCM for treating lumbar pain, and this corresponds with our imaging of long bones to the spine, where the more proximal part of the long bone connects to the lumbar and abdominal area, and then the more distal part of the long bone connects to the neck. So this can be seen in the urinary bladder meridian in the way that we traditionally think of points and their functions 
along this area. So UB40 is indicated for lumbar pain. And now UB57, if you're not using this for upper back pain, especially in the upper thoracic area in between the shoulder blades, this is a great point for pain in the upper thoracic area. And as we've been speaking of dalmas and groups of points, to treat upper back pain between the shoulder blades and the spine, this UB57 point is a fabulous point to use for that. But you're also going to want to add a couple other points to create a dalma. So for upper back pain, locate UB57 and then palpate a couple sun proximal and a couple sun distal and find two more other sensitive points and then do those three and it's a very effective point prescription for upper back pain. Now at UB58 something interesting happens and here the urinary bladder meridian it shifts laterally so UB58 is located seven sun above UB60 and then UB59 is three sun above UB60 and then we have UB60 between the lateral malleolus and the Achilles tendon. And we can see on the image on the right how the soleus muscle, which is also part of the superficial back line, but lays underneath the gastrocnemius, we can start to access that muscle through this area. So I'm going to refer to the UB58 to UB60 area as the soleus band because in those upper points, UB58 and 59, we can access that. So UB60 is a point that's commonly used in TCM style acupuncture. And again, it images the neck and it's indicated for pain in the neck and the back and the shoulders. And it's used for headaches as well. And this point, it's a point I used to needle quite frequently when I was doing TCM, but then since doing the Master Dong style acupuncture and more distal needling, I don't needle this point very often anymore. But what I do is I needle the points above that in the soleus band and in the area of UB58 and UB59. And there are some of the Master Dong points in this region that I tend to needle rather than the traditional points because they were very effective and essentially they're going to have the same result as UB58 and 59 and we'll look at the details of them in one of the following slides. But what I want you to recognize now is that we've got this area where the bladder meridian shifts laterally and then these points above UB60 and then we'll return our discussion to this area when we look at the points known as the seven tigers. And we should also recall that UB62 and small intestine 3 form that tai yang relationship, which is beneficial to the yang chow and the du meridians. And I don't want to say much more about that now, but just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this, because as we start to dig deeper into the material and learn more about the superficial back line and get into the small intestine meridian and the deep back arm line, then we will start to understand how these points pair up like that and see some of the common functions that exist between the small intestine points and the urinary bladder points. So just to sum up what we've talked about here is I want to keep this really simple too. I know this is a lot of new information for you, but the simplicity of it is just think in terms of these regions and bands. So we've got this gastrocnemius band from UB40 down to UB57. We've seen how the imaging plays out here because UB40 is used to treat lumbar pain and UB57 is good for upper back pain. And then the second band that we want to consider is the soleus band. And that is where the urinary bladder shifts laterally and it includes this area from UB58 down to UB59. So both of these muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle, are both part of this superficial back line. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next page, which reads Achilles tendon points. Now, these are some of the master dung points. And because we're discussing these fascial lines, and the way that the fascia plays a role in 
the effects of acupuncture. It's really important to study the master dong points because they demonstrate very clearly the role of the connective tissue and the fascia in the way that acupuncture works on that structural fascial level. Now, with these points, these are fabulous groups of points to use for treating neck pain and occipital headaches, as well as brain disorders and spinal problems, because they're right on the Achilles tendon. So they're going to produce a really strong myofascial result. And the results of that are going to produce benefits in the opposite end of the meridian in the area of the head and the neck. So we've got these points then affecting the region on the opposite end of the meridian and this also corresponds with our imaging where we image the long bones and the ankles and the wrists to the neck. So the distal end of the long bones is connecting to the neck and the hands and the feet are imaging the head. So here we see this example of imaging playing out in the way that these points work in the area of the back of the neck. Now, this image here, it shows a lot of the little muscles. So on top of these muscles, we'll have the trapezius, and that's on a different line. Understand that the trapezius is not on the superficial back line, and the superficial back line includes a lot of these little muscles in the neck. So you can see in the image there that it's able to get to these deep levels. Now let's talk about the location of these points. So the first point, 77.01, is located directly in the tendon and between UB60 and kidney 3. And then the second point, 77.02, is two sun above that. And then the third point is two sun above that. And then the fourth point is two and a half sun above the third point. So we go right in to the tendon when we needle these points. And if you haven't needled them before, that seems strange. And I remember when I first learned these, I was kind of afraid to needle into the tendon because I thought I might hurt someone or it might hurt them. Or, you know, I was a little concerned about that at first, but after needling these points on many, many clients over close to uh, about 16 years now, like I've never had an adverse reaction. And a lot of people don't um, feel these points that strong. Like I've needled these points on children and they don't even notice it hardly and they're okay with it. So these points are not so sensitive as you might initially think they are. So... These points then, the indications are that they treat neck and back and spinal pain. You can use them for pain really anywhere in the spine. I tend to use them more for neck pain and occipital headaches and upper, upper back pain to some degree. They're not my first uh, selection of points for upper back or spinal pain. And I tend to use these points later if for that, and, and they are very effective for that, but I just prefer to start with other points first that reach more of the superficial levels. But if I know a condition is very deep, like within the spine, or if it's within the bones, then uh, I will do these points fairly early in the treatment. Um, so it helps to really understand the different levels that the points are working at. And this is something that we're going to speak of in a number of different occasions in this class. So at the most superficial level in the area of the neck, we have the trapezius. And that's actually on one of the arm lines. So when I treat neck pain, what I'll typically do is I'll start by clearing out the most superficial channels. So I'll do the points that benefit the trapezius to get those superficial levels cleared out. And then because these points work on a, a deeper level within the neck itself, then I may save these for later in the treatment or, or for another treatment down the road, depending on how the client responds. But these are really good points to know about. And you can use them the first time. You know, if, if a patient comes in and they have a severe cervical condition 
or like cervical herniations, then I'd be inclined to use these points. Or if they have a brain condition, I would definitely use these points in the first session. One case study I want to mention here is I had a, a patient. She was a 42-year-old woman. And four years prior to meeting me, she had had a brain surgery for a tumor that she had in her pituitary. And they needed to do surgery. They needed to do a biopsy. And they needed to drain this because she was starting to have visual disturbances and the, the tumor was pressing on the optic nerve. And so they did the brain surgery. Uh, they found out that it was a benign tumor. Um, but the surgery was tremendously difficult on this woman and uh, really had a lot of repercussions. So uh, when she came into my office, she had recently started having occipital headaches and neck pain and some mild visual disturbances. And she was a healthcare professional as well, so she was well aware of the symptomology and uh, the fact that the, the filling of the tumor with fluid could put pressure on the optic nerve. And she was very concerned that she might have to have surgery again. So we did some acupuncture, and these Achilles tendon points were the first ones that I used and the primary points through the treatment. And it was quite amazing because after the first treatment, we, we got mild results. She felt maybe 20 to 30% better after the first session. Uh, but then after the second and the third, we continued to get improvement. And I think by after the third or fourth treatment, she'd seen like 85 to 90% improvement over the course of 10 days and three or four treatments. It was just remarkable to see these results with such a serious condition, the prior medical history. And I continued to treat her over the next two to three months. And I think in total we did eight sessions, but we cleared up the, the symptoms. And neck pain was gone, the occipital headaches, and the visual disturbances, that improved. And, and she became symptom-free like quite quickly. So it was quite remarkable to treat someone with such a condition and to see such dramatic improvements. And I've been able to follow up with her um, over the course of the last three years. And... Um, she's very proactive about doing different things and preventative care. So uh, she hasn't had to have surgery, and she's been able to manage and control the symptoms. She's doing really well. It's really incredible to see what these points can do. So often when we see these superficial backlines and images, and often when we look at the meridians, we may, we may think of these as being uh, vertical lines, but uh, given the example of the case study, it appears that there's also horizontal fascial changes that are occurring. So we can easily trace the fascial lines between the Achilles tendon and the neck muscles. But as this case study demonstrates, it's very likely that there's also fascial changes that are occurring at the deeper levels. So there's these horizontal changes that may be occurring. And I don't mean to uh, come across like the fascial changes can explain every aspect of acupuncture. That's not the case because it's working on so many different systems, like it's working on the neurological level and it's working with the blood and biochemicals and hormones and these things and uh, such. But it's interesting to contemplate and consider how there may be these horizontal shifts as well. And one thing they know about the fascia and acupuncture is that acupuncture it will induce mechanical changes within the fascia and that the fascia will send mechanical signals through the body. So they have uh, unraveled some of the details about how this works and what's going on in the fascia. And by using these needles then, we're able to induce mechanical changes within the fascia that appear to have uh, the ability to work in vertical as well as horizontal planes to affect the deeper regions of the body. And uh, this case study seems to demonstrate that.